Hello Applewood, we are on chapter 22 of Almost Super. It's titled, Do You Feel It? I pushed myself off the ground and felt a familiar tingling. The same tingling I felt just a few days ago sitting on the piano bench. Energy surged through the muscles of my arms, legs, and chest. Charles had his eyes closed and was breathing fast. Juanita was on her hands and knees, her head down. Benny was curled up in a ball. Deep down, even before the sensation was complete, I knew what was happening. I forced myself to stand. The tingling ran through my body. My bones buzzed from my heels to my skull. Pressure built up inside my head. And then, exactly as it had on leap day, something clicked deep inside my brain. My mind blossomed with understanding and knowledge. A final wave of energy rushed through me. And then it was over. Finally, after all this time, I had it. My real power, my true power. Juanita sat crouched on her feet. She steadied herself with one hand on the icy ground and she held the other hand in front of her face as if examining it. Benny got to his feet. Shock and delight covered his face. Do you feel it, Rafter? I heard, heard a rush of air and Benny disappeared. I heard him whomping next to the van. Another whoosh of air and he stood next to me once more. Speed, he said, a giant grin covering his face. I got speed. Charles had recovered. He jumped towards Juanita. Give me my phone. Juanita didn't move, but Charles never touched her. I grabbed his wrist and held it firm, tight enough that Charles would know my power, but not so tight as to crush my bones. Strength, just like Grandpa. I could slam my fist onto the ground and cause the earth to shake. I could walk to the van, shove my hands into the engine, and lift the vehicle up like an empty cardboard box. If I jumped, I could soar 50 feet into the air, and when I landed again, my muscles, my very bones, would withstand the impact. Power surged through me, power that wanted to break free, and yet I had complete control. I grabbed Charles by his arm. I lifted him in the air, then brought him down to me until our noses were almost touching. This power is mine, I said, and no one will take it away from me again. Do you understand? Please don't hurt me, Charles said. His voice sounded small. We're not going to hurt you, I said. We're superheroes. Although if you use your power on us again, we might make things a little uncomfortable for you. Charles nodded. He didn't look too happy. I couldn't help but smile. Benny! Get the duct tape. I never leave home without it, Benny said. He dashed to the van, returned in a few seconds with his backpack. It was scorched, but the contents inside were in good shape. He ripped off a strip of tape and, t and stepped towards the villain. Now, Charles, Benny said in his best tough guy voice, do you want me to do this the easy way or the hard way? Charles tried to run, but before he could take two steps, my brother had caught him, taped up his arms, hands, and legs. Benny finished with a strip of tape across his mouth. I'm tired of hearing you talk. Benny stood over the villain, resting one leg on his chest and then raising his arms in the air. Somebody take a picture, he yelled, and then with another whop, he was gone, dashing around the dump. I couldn't believe it. Just like that, we'd gotten our powers and beaten the villain. We'd done the impossible. I bent over Charles, who didn't look too happy about being taped up and retrieved our phones. Juanita was standing now, holding her hand out in front of her. I held out her phone, and she took it, dropped it into her pocket. Juanita, I asked, are you okay? Juanita nodded absently. Yes, I'm okay. I could see tears in her eyes. I wasn't sure what to say. What do you do when somebody says she's okay, but she doesn't appear to be okay? Did you not get the power you wanted? I finally asked. Juanita made a sound that sounded like a sob and a laugh, both trying to get out of her, vo out of her at once. I'm sorry. I just wasn't ready for it. Ready for your power? Juanita nodded. I got the same power as... She lowered her head for just a moment. Then she looked at me again. I got the same power as my mom. And it makes me miss her. Juanita looked so strong and so vulnerable all at the same time. I wanted to put my arm around her, but I didn't dare. It's okay, she said. I'm okay. She wrapped her arms around herself. You know, with mom gone... It's always just been me and dad. He's great. He does so much for me, but I've always felt like, I've always felt alone. But tonight, working with you and Benny? Juanita looked at me. I felt like I should say something, but I didn't know what. Anyway, she said, thanks. I cleared my throat. What's your power, I asked. She smiled and pointed her hand at Charles. 
A rope of flame poured out of her hand and lit up the night sky. It arced across the darkness, passing a foot over Charles, who was laying on the ground. He tried to scream in terror, but the duct tape kept him relatively quiet. Whoa, said Benny, who had materialized in a rush of wind. That is the some wild stuff. Juanita smiled. This is how they did it, she said, holding up Charles' phone. This controls the tower. This gives or takes away powers. Does that mean everybody has their power back? I asked. I tried to imagine my entire extended family with Manita's entire family, all with their powers back. This could be ugly. Juanita tossed me the phone. I think so. There are only two settings, real powers or fake powers. I looked at the phone. It was a simple interface. I selected the tower menu and two buttons appeared on the screen. The red button took away powers. The green button gave them back. I had an idea. I slipped Charles' phone into my pocket and pulled out my other phone. Juanita said, call your family. Tell them to come here. Why? Juanita asked. I pulled my dad's number on the screen. We need to do what Oscar Redding could never do. We need to get both families together right now. We need to start talking and we need to prove once and for all who the real villains are. If that doesn't get the family to stop fighting, nothing will. Juanita nodded, pulled out her phone. Well, we'd done it. These kids without real powers had done the impossible. We saved the day. That is when the black helicopter descended from the sky. Chapter 23. Would you be so kind as to explain this mess? In a flash, Benny was by my side. What's that sound, he asked. I had just spotted the aircraft and pointed towards the flashing lights in the sky. Helicopter, it must be Dirk. I didn't think that was one of ours, Benny said. He was right. It didn't have the Bailey family colors. I looked over at Juanita. You guys have helicopters? She shook her head. If we have one, I've never seen it. The helicopter came to rest on the ground. I could see the moon and the stars reflecting on the gleaming black metal. Wind from the blades tore at my coat, and I took an involuntary step back, shielding my eyes. The engine began to wind down. For a moment, nothing happened. The helicopter sat there like a bug staring at us, as if it was waiting for us to make the first move. There was no question in my mind. The Joneses' family had arrived. The tactical side of my brain took over. Inside the helicopter were the Joneses, and I had no idea how many or what powers they had. What I did know was that there was only three of us to stand against them. I still had my phone in my hand, and it still had Dad's number on the screen. I hit the send button. Hello? I heard Dad's voice. I also heard a loud of shouting. Rafter, I'm a bit busy. One of the Johnsons has Uncle Ralph in a headlock, and your Aunt Verna won't stop. I saw Juanita pull out her own phone. Dad, I said, you have to get the city dump. Benny and I are here. Dad, there are supervillains. What are you talking about, Dad said. We saw that strange light again, and we all got our powers back. We're fighting the entire Johnson clan, right? Dad, I said. There's no time to explain. Benny and I are in trouble. That was all it took. Trouble? I heard Dad cover the phone with his hand, then heard a muffled shout through the phone. It's the boys. They're in danger. Dad's voice became louder on the phone. We'll be there in ten minutes. Juanita spoke into her phone. After a moment, she hung up and said, My family's on the way, too. I looked at the helicopter. The whine of the motor became quieter, and the blades slowed. We had to stall for ten minutes. We had to survive for ten minutes. At least we had our powers. The helicopter door slid open. A pilot sat at the controls. In the middle section of the helicopter, where three or even four people could have fit, sat a single man, a man who took up the entire space. I've never seen anybody as big as the man who stepped out of the helicopter. He had to bend over at the waist until he was out from under the blades. He wore a suit, not a super suit, but an actual suit and tie. The man was bald, just like Charles, and I was surprised to see a similar metal plate attached to his head. He had a round and puffy face, and his eyes were thin black slits. When he stood up, I realized he had to be at least seven feet tall. He had arms like tree branches and legs as thick as telephone poles. The man looked strong, terribly strong. I smiled in the darkness. My first real challenge. The man's head was like a rock. It turned first one way and then the other. His gaze rested on Charles, who was still lying on the ground. 
He'd somehow managed to get his hands in front of him and had pulled the tape from his mouth. The giant spoke, his voice deep and rough. Charles, would you be so kind as to explain this mess? Charles struggled to sit up. There's no mess, Grandpa. I had, um, a minor setback, that's all. I was just about to wrap things up when you got here. Grandpa? The large man standing before me was the head of the entire family? October Jones? The giant paused for a moment, not saying a word. The silence was awkward. Finally, he spoke again. Well then, Charles, if you got everything under control, I'll see you back at headquarters. No, Charles said, getting up on his knees. Grandpa, I'm sorry. I, these kids, they're, they're monsters. Please, Grandpa, I need your help. The big guy turned to look at Benny, Juanita, and me. Another pause. The tactic side of my brain tingled. Something wasn't right. So you've been beaten by three children, the giant said. Charles, just when I think you can't set my expectations any lower, you botch things up in ways I couldn't possibly believe. The giant laughed, and it sounded like a cement truck barreling down a gravel road. My heart pounded, but I cleared my mind. I looked around, drawing the dump again in my head. Each person in a vehicle became a dot. Charles, Juanita, Benna, Benny, and the giant, the helicopter, the van. I made a list of things I had to use in a fight. Something still tickled the back of my mind. Enough, the giant roared. Charles, it's time for you to learn a lesson. Watch how it's done giant began to walk towards us. I was probably imagining it, but I thought I felt the ground shaking under our feet. I looked at the helicopter, at the giant. He kept pausing before he spoke. What was I missing? I saw a flash of light on the side of the giant's head. Moonlight reflected in the darkness, and I knew the answer. I formed a plan. Benny, I said, speaking slow and clear. When I give the word, you go left. Make sure Charles doesn't interfere. If he tries to levitate anybody, keep him busy. Benny nodded, a fierce smile creeping over his face. Juanita, I said, you go right and try to distract the giant. Wait a minute, Juanita said. You want me to take on the big guy? Aren't you the one who's got super strength? The giant was 20 feet from us. Use your power. I pointed to the van. Or if the van still works, see if you can distract him with that. Juanita looked like she wanted to argue, but there was no point in waiting any longer. Go, I shouted. Both of them moved, our first battle, and still we were working like a team. Benny went left, Juanita went right. I stepped forward, back it, walking towards the giant. We met in the middle and stopped. I had to look up to see his face. His head turned first to look at Benny, then at Juanita. Finally, he gazed, came to rest on me. I felt power surging through my muscles. The man before me was strong. He had to be, but I was stronger. Again, the pause. The giant stood there as if he didn't know what to say or what to do. And then he spoke. Tonight is not your lucky night, little boy. No, I said, I believe it is. Two things happened at once. To my left, Charles got on his feet, only to be rewarded by Benny charging into his stomach. They both fell to the ground. To my right, the black and smoldering van roared to life. Juanita sat behind the wheel, tugging at the gear shift. The wipers turned on, then off. The van lurched, stopped, and then lurched again. The giant turned his head to look at the van. The headlights flared to life, and the giant shielded his eyes. With the van, van lights bathing us, I could see it. A small coil of wire coming out of the collar of the suit, ending in the giant's ear. An earpiece. October Jones, the real villain, was here but he wasn't the hulking figure in front of me. Every time the giant had spoken, there had been a pause, as if he'd been waiting for instructions. I remember a line from the Wizard of Oz, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. I raced forward, not at the hulking figure, but around him, towards the helicopter. Sitting in the pilot's seat was a figure, a small figure bent over and frail, almost invisible behind the windshield. And my hunch was right. This was the real October Joe.